this message. Greetings, family. It's your brother, Landon X. And uh, let's take a look at something. Somebody come look at this. But not only that, but on top of that, your brother, Al Sharpton, tomorrow or this week will actually give a Dr. King Award to Anthony Fauci, who is the, uh, the main brain behind what they're calling a COVID-19 vaccine. But again, somebody come look at this. Let's talk about it. family i'm your brother landon x and of course this is nation town tv live and as you just uh, saw on that intro we're dealing with a problem yeah, but i'm gonna go a little deeper than just the obvious but as you saw in that intro that was our brother jesse jackson as well as a uh, flyer announcing the uh, awarding of a Dr. King Award to Anthony Fauci given by the National Action Network, which is the organization of our brother. I'll use that word. Uh, Al Sharpton. 
But before we get into it, let me just go ahead and start off in the proper fashion. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the most merciful, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah who appeared to us in the person of Master W. Far Muhammad, the long-awaited Messiah of the Christians and the Mahdi of the Muslims, came 9,000 miles by himself to seek and save which was lost. I further bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger, but with all due respect to Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah, peace be upon him, I have to bear witness that the Holy Quran made me a promise, made you a promise in several different ayats, including 16 and 36, as well as in 1047, where it promises us that that messenger would speak the language of the people, meaning that that person would be able to understand the sojourn of that people, be able to empathize, not just sympathize. Prophet Muhammad Ibn Abdullah, he absolutely sympathized with the sojourn of the black man. That's why he heard our footsteps in heaven before his own in his own vision. But I'm speaking of the messenger known as the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, who at minimum is the messenger of Allah. And I would know nothing of Master Fahd Muhammad or the most honorable Elijah Muhammad if it were not for the leadership. Let me emphasize that the leadership and guidance of this Beautiful brother right here. And when I say beautiful, I'm not just talking about him being a handsome man. I'm talking about his spirit, his dedication, and his loyalty to his people. I'm speaking of none other than the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And in those three great names, I greet the Nation Town family. In the words of peace, we say it in the Arabic language of Assalamu Alaikum. Shout out to everybody chiming in. As always, definitely hit your brother up and Nation Town up with questions or comments. I see you. Uh, Kulsum Akbar, Wa Alaikum Salam, Rhea Darcy McCauley, uh, Jerome Blakely, Wa Alaikum Salam, Brother Hakeem, Wa Alaikum Salam, Brother Michael, uh, all praises are due to Allah, as well as Shah Jones. Uh, go ahead and chime in, hit us up with your questions and comments. I already see a couple of uh, very good comments uh, before we get started. But as you can see, the title is The Leadership Problem. Black people, Aboriginal people in America, we have a problem with our leadership and the way we see leadership. And that was brought to my mind when I saw that painful short video of Jesse Jackson. It was painful to me. I couldn't laugh. I couldn't complain. I couldn't. All I could do was I, I felt I, 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 it was like, let me let me try to put it in words. It was like seeing a matriarch or a patriarch in your family that you have fond memories of being very strong and independent and, 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 and able, and then you see them debilitated or sick or on their deathbed. It's, it's, it's hard to watch, not by his age or, or, or anything like that, but just what he was doing, the whole picture around him. And then right after that, like a one-two punch, I got the news that Reverend Al Sharpton <laughs> is awarding a Dr. King Award to Anthony Fauci. Anthony Fauci. Let me first say this. Well, I, I, I'll go here first. Let me let me stick to the proper protocol. This is Nation Town TV Live, brought to you by NationTownStore.com. Shout out to everybody uh, supporting NationTownStore.com. And I'm going to touch on that because that relates to what we're going to get into not just nationtownstore.com, but the purpose behind it, as well as doforself.net. Shout out to everybody that's been perusing that. Like I've been promising, it's going to get a major update very soon. It's an online learning annex where you can get free information about multiple uh, self-improvement uh, topics. So make sure y'all touch on that. But let me say this first and foremost when it comes to our brother, Jesse and our brother Al Sharpton. I'm not here. If you if you're tuning in right now to see me 
drag my brothers and, and, and insult them personally. That's not the spirit of my teacher, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, and that won't be my spirit here. And they, you really can't drag them more than, than that particular action can drag them. I mean, they drag in themselves, you know, and the minister has spoken sharply about his, his brothers, which are good friends of his, uh, regardless of how they treat him. And, you know, looking at this image again, after seeing that video from Jesse Jackson, after learning of Al Sharpton giving an award to, you know, essentially the latest uh, reincarnation of the Tuskegee attack. This picture right here, this image makes so much more sense now. I mean, it made sense then, but now it, it, it really hits home. It really hits home. And now you can look at this. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. This is worth about 1.5 million right here. This is a Actual photo from the homegoing ceremonies for our sister Aretha Franklin. The minister was specifically invited by Aretha's family. Uh, he did not get a chance to speak, but he went viral. The minister went viral because people, not just members of the nation, that's not people were so impressed by how he sat there with such a solemn and, 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 and fantastic demeanor. Even though he never, everybody and their mama got a chance to speak. I think I spoke at Aretha's uh, uh, funeral, but everybody got a chance to, to speak, except for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Now, I've heard uh, differing things. Some people said he never got, he was never supposed to speak. Some people said, well, he, he, he was going to speak, but they ran out of time. There was a lot of different things involved, but... This went viral because people were like, look at how, how calm he is. And then the body language of Al Sharpton, Al, uh, Mr. Stickman Sharpton. Shout out to Al Sharpton losing all that weight. I'm not sure how he did it, if it was natural or not. But, uh, you know, he, he wasn't living a healthy life before. So shout out to him for that. And then our brother, Jesse, uh, Keep Hope Alive, Jackson. Like I said, I'm not going to sit here. And, and bash my brothers in that manner. Like they said, what they've done in this situation speaks for itself. But it brought to my mind just the problem that we have with leadership. We don't properly deal with leadership as a people. We're not getting the right kind of leadership from everyone who wants to carry that torch. And it's a lot of us who want that torch for some strange reason, want that torch. They want to be considered or seen as a leader of our people who are the hardest people to lead from within. Now, we're easily led in the wrong direction from without by our open enemy, but nearly impossible to lead from within. So I'm going to get into some of the reasons why and why leadership disappoints us so often it has to do with the leadership themselves and it has to do with us so let's get right into it uh shout out to everybody chiming in um sister Rhea says they are paying him and sharpton mm, we're gonna touch on something similar to that stay tuned sister Rhea. uh she also says how many times have they thrown us under the bus and i heard you can buy them cheaply Perhaps so. We're going to touch on that. We're going to touch on that. Brother Jerome says he's broken. That's that's kind of what I got from that. He's Jesse seemed tired. Now, now let me say this about you. Let me let me cover just how I feel about those two individuals, starting with Jesse. I've always had a certain amount of respect for Jesse Jackson. Really? For two reasons. One, he was one of the youngest and, and most zealous uh, disciples of Dr. King. And I have my, my criticisms of all of the so-called civil rights leaders. I have the things that I feel like, uh, you know, they, they did not 
do correctly or that they shouldn't have done. But I respect the fact that they put themselves in harm's way for what they believed was the best route for us as a people. So I respect them on that minimum. And then you have to consider that if there was never a Jesse Jackson, there would not have been a Barack Obama. There would not have been many of the the recent political uh, the the political success that certain black people and people of color have had, so-called people of color have had over the last 30, 40 years. He he broke a lot of barriers. He came the closest before Barack Obama to becoming president of the United States. The Nation of Islam got behind him the first time he ran for president. Him being good friends with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and the most honorable Elijah Muhammad said that when we find a candidate in politics that appears to be honest and has sincere, and I'm paraphrasing, but has sincere hopes for the people and willing to fight for our people, we should get behind a black candidate that matches that description. So that's what the minister did when he put the weight of the FOI behind uh, Brother Jesse in the first time he ran. But then controversy arose. Uh, the media attacked Farrakhan and honestly, Jesse didn't do much to defend his brother. And their relationship has been kind of topsy-turvy ever since then. But the minister has never been, <laughs> he's never went into his feelings about the fact that he will defend Jesse at all costs. But Jesse doesn't always seem to uh, defend him. And But growing up, I grew up in the 80s and the 90s, which was Jesse's heyday. And I never could connect with his message. Because his message didn't connect in my in my personal judgment. And I'm not, this is not bashing him. This is just my perception as a child, seeing him on television and hearing him. He had this, he, he was the master of slogans. He would come up with slogans like in his sleep. But he would always say, he would tell us to, to chant, I am somebody. I am somebody. And to quote our brother. Dr. Khaled Muhammad, he put it perfectly. He would he would mock Jesse and he would say, I am a, a somebody. I don't rightly know who I am, but I do know that I am. So and that's exactly what I thought when I when I would hear Jesse, like, what do you mean I am somebody? I know that. Now, granted, there are a lot of black youth who really don't know that they are somebody. But you got to finish that sentence, Jesse. I felt this way for 30 some years. You got to finish that sentence, bro. And that's what I love about the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the guidance of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. It, we answer that question in question number one of our student enrollment. Who is the original man? The original man is the Asiatic black man, the maker, the owner, the cream of the planet Earth, God of the universe. It's, it's answered and that, that caught me just like that. Thank you. Elijah, thank you, Farrakhan, for finishing that sentence that Jesse didn't finish. Now, Al Sharpton, I, I have to be honest with you. I don't get it. I, I, I never understood the lure, and I've never, I've never ran into a Al Sharpton follower. I've seen, I remember as a small child, Riding in the car and looking out the window and seeing a Jesse for president placard in somebody's front yard. I've, I remember I've seen posters. I've seen people really. I got a chance in college to see to come in here. Jesse speak. But I never seen somebody say, man, did you hear what Sharpton said today? Or oh, man, did you see what Sharpton did? Oh, man, I really like what Sharpton is saying about X, Y and Z. Sharpton, to me, seems 100% manufactured by the media as a black leader. Now, Sharpton has been seen as that picture, but even before that, when he was a big boy, when he, was, when he looked like a black Santa Claus, you would see him. Uh, he would attend mosque meetings at Mosque Mariam. He would attend other events, and you would see him in the crowd. 
He always struck me as an opportunist. These days, instead of saying opportunists, they say clout chasers. That's the that's the term today. He he basically he coined that. He coined that idea of being this clout chasing, uh, ambitious leader. Now to lead us to what? I don't know. I can't answer that question with Al Sharpton. There's been a lot of controversy in his life. A lot of things that he's done very questionably, including even being an FBI informant. <laughs> Literally, this is it's documented. So I just never got it. I can I can vouch for Jesse a little bit. I can say some things that Jesse did that are that are that are worth repeating and worth respecting. I'm not saying we should disrespect Brother Al Sharpton. And and I and, and I'm humble enough to say that there may be just some things that I'm not aware of, some sacrifices he made that I'm not aware of. I know there was a time where he got stabbed and, and this kind of confused me. This didn't make me kind of respect him. It really confused me. He was stabbed by a white man once when he was doing a, a, a protest in New York and he refused to file charges against that white man. He dropped all charges against the man that stabbed him, who was a Caucasian. But that got him a lot of publicity. I just I, I just never got it with Jesse Jackson. But let's get into it. Shout out to everybody chiming in. I see you. Uh, I see you, Brother Todd Hitton. He says, 53rd Surah of the Quran, which is titled The Star. By the star, when it sets, your companion errs not, nor does he deviate, nor does he speak out of desire. It is not but revelation that is revealed. One mighty in power has taught him the Lord of strength, so he attained to perfection, and he is in the highest part of the horizon. Brother Michael says, we in the nation love all of our people, regardless of faith and ideologies. When our people make an error or bad judgment in the public, we take time to make the correction with the spirit of love. Exactly. Dear Brother Michael, and, and if it be the will of Allah, that's what I intend to do. But I'm going to go a lot deeper. Y'all should know Nation Town by now. We always go a lot deeper than the inciting incident. Every every video we do, every Nation Town Live topic, there's an inciting incident, an incident that made us go into that topic. But we go a, little, a, lot, a lot deeper than the surface, uh, or at least we we try. We, we make the attempt. But we're going to look into some things because this is a topic that nobody's really talking about as far as our issue with black leadership. We just kind of tiptoe through the tulips because there's some things within our relationship with leadership in our community that says a lot about our condition. Now, let's look at the word leader itself. Leader has its root. In the English language, English meaning straight out of England, it, it was a word known as laden, laden. And what it means is when you go before someone as a guide, you go first. You, you spy out the promised land, so to speak. You go about it first. You lead and then you guide those behind you. That's the term. That's what the term leader actually means. First and foremost, Aboriginal people have issue. We, we have a erroneous understanding of what a leader is off top. Off top. First of all, a lot of us don't really know the difference between a leader and a carrier. <laughs> in fact, we think they're one and the same. When we even talk about leadership or a particular leader, the first thought comes to a Negro's man, not a black man's brain, but a Negro's brain is, man, what they did for me? Did for you? See, so we got to we got to be honest and say, do we even really know what a leader is? If a leader is leading you somewhere, that means they're headed in that, dire in that direction regardless. And they will help you to follow them. They go left, you go left. They go right, you go right. They jump, you jump. They're leading you in a certain direction, but they're not a carrier. A leader will not carry you. You gotta, if you're a grown man, you gotta do something for yourself. 
And the best thing that a grown man, the main thing that a grown man, a grown woman wants from a leader is simple guidance. Just give me the instructions, brother or sister. Where do I go from here? What turn do I make here? It's a GPS. That's what we want from real leadership. But a lot of us mistake that from being carried. And that comes from the welfare mentality that this world has put on us. And the welfare system that the American government has put on us has actually turned out to be one of the most debilitating and, and, and deconstructive things that have ever happened to anybody on the face of this earth. Because you really do. I hate to sound, I hate to echo uh, the Ronald Reagan era, but you do have generational welfare families. I don't want to use the words he used. He called them welfare queens of Chicago, which was highly uh, disrespectful for him to single out one city and single out our sisters. But you do have generational welfare cases in families where the only wisdom that's passed down is how to benefit off the system. So that's given us this idea that anybody that really cares about us They'll they'll put some cheese on our plate, some government cheese on our plate. They'll give us a little check. They'll give us this. They'll give us that. They give, 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 give. And really, when you realize what they're taking, what they're giving is even more insufficient or less sufficient than what it already appears to be. But let's let's get into it. First and foremost, we covered that. But now, since we know what a leader is. Whenever someone poses as a leader and comes before you, as Aboriginal people, we got to start asking the question, okay, they're supposed to go before us and guide us. What are they guiding us to? That's why I said with, with Al Sharpton, I, I just never got it. Maybe it's something that I'm just ignorant of when it comes to that brother. But I've never been sure where is this brother trying to lead us? With Dr. King, you knew where he was trying to lead us. You could agree or disagree, but you knew where he, he wanted us to be, to have in, the, in his early. After the, the I Have a Dream speech, early 60s, he wanted nearness to the master. He got it for himself first. Remember, Nobel Peace Prize. He sat in the Oval Office and met with two presidents, John F. Kennedy and Lyndon B. Johnson. So he got nearness to his master. And he said, you know what? I want this for my people. Was he wrong for that? Absolutely. But I respect the fact that he walked into a smoke-filled room, as the minister put it at the Million Man March. But he said, you know what? It's no good if I'm the only one in these rooms. I want all my people to be. I have a dream that all my people can get patted on the head by Massa. That was his perception. He was raised to think like that. He went to college at, at Morehouse and they taught him to think like that. Most black colleges teach our students to think like that. We're going we're gonna to build you up and make you the best, smartest, most successful slave. That's, that's the, the cloth that Dr. King was originally cut from. He's a third generation. He was a third generation preacher. And we're going to touch on preachers in a minute. So you got to ask yourself, where are they leading you? Now, some of them, like Dr. King, early, before, you know, after the post uh, I Have a Dream speech, he wanted to lead you into the bosom of your enemy. That's where he wanted to lead you. It was clear. Then some of them, some leaders, such as the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, they want to lead you to self-improvement, which is the basis for community development. Then they want to lay out a blueprint. They want to lay out a, a visual aid, as they call it in art, a visual aid to give you an idea, to give you a bowl of fruit. And you draw that bowl of fruit, you mimic the, the shadowing and everything, but that's a visual aid. And after drawing a, 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 a visual aid, then you can, you can draw something just out of memory. That's how people learn how to draw and how to paint. 
So the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Honorable Mr. Louis Farrakhan have given us visual aids. They propped up businesses. They propped up organization. They propped up proper living. And they said, now you go and do it. And, and then you teach your brother. And then your brother teaches his brother. And then it spreads. It goes viral. Viral is not a word that was invented for the Internet. Viral can be good or bad. Just whenever something is spread, each one teach one. So they can take you to the bosom of the white man. They can take you to self-improvement. They can also take you <laughs> to the ATM. <laughs> you have leadership who want to be leaders just as a profession. Just so they can live a certain lifestyle. Now, with black folks, that's tricky. That's a tricky, tricky thing. In fact, I wouldn't even recommend it. If all you all you have is a hustle and you're just trying to get, get over. Oh, man, if you're white and you're aiming at white people. Hell, even if you're black and you're aiming at white people or you're Asian and you're aiming at Asian people. OK, I can understand. But black folks, we don't really know how to support each other like that. Sure, we give a lot of money to a church and whatnot. But even with a church, there's a lot of little hole in the wall churches that can hardly pay their rent. I was reading an a, a article before the quarantine where church foreclosures were at an all-time high. So this idea that every church is getting over hand over fist is, is actually not true. Either that or the pastor and deacon them stealing money. But, <laughs> but that's what some people want to when they, like they got this thing now called thought leaders. Let me, let me be very clear about something for the sake of clarity and transparency. When it comes to nation town, there's a reason why this is nation town TV and it's not, and this is no shot at anybody else, but it's not brother Landon TV. It's not brother Alfonso TV. It's not sister Shauna joy TV. It's nation town TV because when you think about the, 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 the idea of a Korea town, a little Filipino town, Chinatown, when you're thinking about a you know, little Irish town, whenever you're thinking about a town or a city or a state or any municipality or nation or country, it always has two elements, two main elements. It always has an economy and it has communications. So that's what we're doing right now. This is the communication. NationTownStore.com, that's the economy. Selling nation-produced goods. So it's not about a person or a personality. It's about a purpose. So to be very clear on that. But now they have something called thought leaders. These are people who many of them are sincere. I'm sure some of them are not. And they come before you, you know, of themselves. <laughs> as opposed to being uh, backed by anything. They come to you for themselves and of themselves. And... You can't really pinpoint too much real action behind what they're saying, but they a lot of times they give valuable information. And then, just like anybody on this earth, they have bills to pay. They have things to do and, and things that they want, so <laughs> they lead you to the ATM. They tell you, I'm somebody who will, like they got something called life coaching now. I'm... Still trying to wrap my head around what, what that's supposed to mean because uh, I'm not going to go there. But, <laughs> they, you know, so they, they're giving you valuable information. Some of it's cookie cutter. Some of it's really valuable. And then, you know, they, they say, well, come here now. Take this much money out the ATM and send it my way. It's kind of like that prayer water that, that, that them Negroes be, be, be selling on them late night uh, televangelist things, you know. So you got those who take you to the bosom of your enemy, those who take you toward self-improvement, those who take you toward the ATM. Now, paying these leaders, putting money in their pocket is not altogether a negative thing. Speaking of which, <laughs> go ahead and hit us up, cash out, dollar side, nation town, if you feel it to your heart. But we're going to touch on that in a minute. We're going to touch on that. Or... The fourth thing that they could be bringing you toward or trying to lead you to is the concert. Now, what do I mean by that? 
There are certain people, and I'm going to touch on this in a minute as well. There are certain people amongst our community who take on the role of a leader just because they want the attention. They want to be seen of men. They want to be heard. They want to, you know, that they, they have a thirst to be seen. They have a thirst just to be respected and for people to roll out carpets in front of them, whether they be red or white carpets. And they just want that respect. And, and that's one of the reasons so many of our artists in music and in other entertainment fields, they leave, they leave this earth broke because all they really wanted was the attention and the celebrity behind their talents. And other people took all the money, their lawyers, their, their managers, and all of them, most of which were Jewish, took all of that and ran. And then they die penniless because we have this thirst. And there's a reason why we have that thirst and we're going to get that into it. And it makes me think of that, that old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. We always hear that terminology or that phrase or that saying when somebody is trying to console you, when you've tried to do something good for people. And then they didn't and then they didn't return the favor. But there's two ways to look at that saying, in my humble estimation. Not only can you be led by somebody, but you don't have to drink. You don't have to drink the water, meaning that even if you are following a leader. And you might have suspicions that they might be trying to get this over on you and they're trying to do this and trying to do that. Just just follow at a safe distance. And then when you see them taking you to the water, either to, to, to for you to drink or for them to drown you in it, you don't have to go to the water with. Them. But you might find something on that path that can be beneficial to you. And then that's when y'all can part ways and go your separate ways. But don't ever just look at it like you're being dragged. You're a grown man. You're a grown woman. What can they really do to you? If you're following with, 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 with the right mind, if you understand. Now, let's get into this. I mentioned MLK. Because MLK, you have to be very, very careful with Dr. King and his legacy. Because there's a legacy of Dr. King that is well known and well documented. And really force fed down the throats of, uh, of all of us who were born after 1968. And it's this, I have a dream, Negro, Dr. King. And then there's another legacy that they've tried to bury. And they've really been very successful in burying him. And go ahead and watch this and just to kind of encapsulate what I'm saying. I must confess that uh, that dream that I had that day has at many points turned into a nightmare. Now, I'm not one to lose hope. I keep on hoping. Uh, I still have faith in the future, but I've had to analyze many things over the last few years, and I would say over the last few months. I've gone through a lot of soul searching and agonizing moments. From a dream to a nightmare, straight out of the, 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 the reverend's mouth. Straight out of the doctor's mouth, he told you. It went from a dream to a nightmare. Now, think about this. We're talking about a very short span of time. Four years. This is 2021. Four years ago was what? 2017. 2017 felt like yesterday. But that's how much time it took from Dr. King. At the top of the world, everybody's favorite Negro. Nobel Peace Prize. I have a dream. Little white babies and black babies is holding hands. And, all. and then four years later, the same distance from 2017 to 2021, he's saying, you know what? It's a nightmare. He told his friend, uh, I believe it was Harry Belafonte. He said, I believe that I've integrated my people. Or I'm afraid that I've integrated my people into a burning house. Dr. King. Now, all of this came about, of course, 
this pivot, <laughs> interestingly enough, followed a very historic meeting between the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Dr. King. Oh, what I would have done to just been a fly on that wall, to just be a roach in the corner, to just be a flea. <laughs> I mean, I would have, I would give everything, anything I have to have been in that room, to hear that conversation, to hear that conversation, to see that meeting of the minds, these two Southern Georgia boys, with so much impact and so much courage, regardless of how you feel about either one, you cannot deny the courage and the love that they show for their people. You can't deny that. You, you, can, you can talk about their, their, their execution, their belief system, but for these two giants in our history, it ain't too, it's not too many Aboriginal people here in America in modern time that I feel like can stand with the Shaka Zulus and the Mansa Musas, the Hannibals of our history. But those two men absolutely can and could and do as far as my mind is concerned. But they came together and they came together with a plan. They had a plan of attacking poverty and want in the most impoverished parts of America. And immediately after this meeting, Dr. King changed his position on many issues. He suddenly had an economic message. He suddenly had an anti-war message. How did, where did that come from? He pointed out the land grants that Caucasians benefited from. On a previous episode, we talked about the land run in Oklahoma, how the University of Oklahoma got his name the soonest. Dr. King suddenly was teaching on that. He was, he was staunchly against the Vietnam War. And that's what got him murdered. So that's what got him murdered. And it all stemmed from that meeting. It was Savior's Day weekend. He actually promised the messenger that he would attend say, the Savior's Day event that weekend. But I'm pretty sure he got some pressure from the enemy that prevented him from, from going. And not too long later or afterward, our brother was murdered on that uh, balcony at the Lorraine Hotel. So, let's deal with how leadership, how we've kind of mutated that understanding. And we mutated the term leadership. Because it's really been tampered with in a deeper fashion than we really understand. There is a man, or was a man, or girl man, girl, whatever you want to call him or it, by the name of J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover is the father of the way the American federal government operates as it, as it pertains to legal issues. He is the father of the FBI. He is the father of a program that you see right here, COINTELPRO, but I always seek to remind my brothers and sisters that COINTELPRO as a system started with wiretaps, infiltration in black organizations, agents, provocateurs, stool pigeons, spying, all that kind of stuff. That was, that was the, that was, that was COINTELPRO at its infant stage. While J. Edgar Hoover was still among us. 
but the spirit of COINTELPRO bled into almost everything the government does, and even this, in this day and age, what the media does. It even bled into the social services of our government. I talked about the welfare mentality a minute ago. COINTELPRO now exists in social services. Certain Section 8 programs that tells a young, struggling, uh, single black mother, hey, hey, we'll give you a house. We'll give you food stamps. We'll give you a stipend to get, you know, milk and stuff for your children. We'll give you all kinds of services, but you better not be caught with a black male over the age of 18 in that house or we'll take it all away from you. If anybody breaks the law, there go that 13th Amendment sinking in. If anybody breaks the law, we'll take it all away from you. But we'll take care of you for now. That has remnants of COINTELPRO in it. Now, keep in mind, the mission statement, the unofficial but official mission statement of COINTELPRO is to stop the rise of a black messiah. Don't ever... Allow yourself to believe that just because you don't see this Caucasian in this government, you don't see our government leaders or American government leaders, not your leaders, not mine, but government leaders talking a whole lot about God. It'll slip out their mouth every now and then. They say that this is one nation under God, and it is. It's a nation under God, trying to get up under God, trying to get past him by digging up under him, trying to. But it's not a it's not a nation rooted in God. That's what the nation of Islam is. But you don't hear a lot of God talk from Caucasians, but don't ever trick yourself into thinking that they don't know theology, that they don't know their Bible, that they don't know the Quran. Don't think that Quran is just something that Arabs and black people deal with. No, you go into the judge's chamber of any judge in any court in America they have a copy of the Quran, a well-read copy, not no new copy. Some of our Qurans look like it ain't never been touched. But I guarantee you, you go into a judge's chamber. In fact, Thomas Jefferson has a Quran that's, that's being preserved in Washington, D.C. right now. Somebody has to come and put glue on it every year to keep it together because Thomas Jefferson read that Quran so frequently that it's, it's tattered. If the wind blows, it'll, it'll, it'll disintegrate in the wind because he read it so much. He was very familiar with the Holy Quran. So they know prophecy. They know scripture. Now, we know that a black Messiah, you know, sorry, sisters. Now, there are, there are female prophets and there were female prophets. In fact, in my humble estimation, every black mother is a prophet in her own right as far as I'm concerned. But we do know by scripture, the prophecy of scripture, that the Messiah will be a male. That's why King Herod and Pharaoh in the scripture was always going after the firstborn male. So that war on the on the male, on the black male, you, you can see it reflected in almost all the tentacles of this government. And it's leaked into, I won't even say leaked, it's been... <laughs> It's been indoctrinated. It's been inserted in the media as well. Now, this is America, and America likes to likes to tout and brag to other countries that they don't have a federally restricted uh, media. Like you go to places like China, China runs everything. There are no different broadcast, free, independent broadcast networks. No, they, they, they run everything. They don't even have Facebook in China. They have their own version of Facebook, and I respect that. And they're very, you know, concerned and very strict about what's on that. But here in America, it may seem like you have independent broadcast channels and platforms, but the truth of the matter is they're all still controlled, and they still take their cues from the federal government. So what that does is that has fed from the social services to the images that we see on TV. You never saw a single mother on television until you saw that that one show uh, 
I forgot the sister's name. Some of y'all in the Nation Town family helped me out. Um, it was one of the first successful black um, um, actresses. And she did a TV show where she was a nurse and she was a single mother. When that show came out, you couldn't find a single mother on television. And then not too long after that, they had another movie where uh, I, I can't remember, but I know Gladys Knight was on the soundtrack. But in the 70s, they had a, a movie, a TV movie that followed a welfare mother. And I think it was the same actress. <laughs> so they started pushing this, this image of single mother households. They started, and then simultaneously they pushed the message through black exploitation films of black men who were not family men. They were womanizers. They were pimps. They were gangsters, tough guys. But you never saw them taking care of their family. You never saw them being uh, 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 loyal to one woman. You never saw that. So the goal of stopping the rise of a black messiah it's now started at the earliest possible point. They're not waiting for somebody to reach a certain position in the nation of Islam or the Black Panthers or whatever the case may be, or in politics, and then start tapping his phone. They're not doing that no more. That's, that's played out. They still do that. But they know that if they have to do that, that means they dropped the ball somewhere way further back upfield. Because now they've made it where households, black households, are now anti-black male. You have entire households where the approval rating of the black male is rock bottom to everybody in the house, not just the women. Not just the women, because first of all, the black male is not there. The patriarch is not there. The male figure is not there, but there's still male babies being born in that household. So the mother, she's talking about niggas ain't shh. And then that trickles down to the daughter. And she's already thinking at a young age, she's not even into relationships yet, but it's already planted in her mind that niggas ain't shh. And then the little boy, he's not even a man yet, and he's already thinking niggas ain't shh. So he's going to grow up to either be this is their plan now, and it's unfortunately worked. He's going to grow up to either be a gang member or a gangster or a hustler who does not care about the black man and actually has a disease in his heart for any other black man he runs into, or he's going to grow up not wanting to be a black man at all, not even wanting to be heterosexual, wanting to be other than a man, period. And you wonder why there seems to be an increase in homosexuality. It goes back to COINTELPRO. Stop the rise of a black messiah. So let's fast forward to 2021. I'm still talking about Jesse and, 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 and Al Sharpton. But we got to be careful when we see leadership do something we don't like. Listen to yourself after you see leadership do something you don't like. What, 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 uh, what, what thing do you jump to? It's the same thing with black businesses as opposed to white businesses. You don't even think like that. You don't even think, our people don't even think white-owned businesses. You go to Starbucks and they get your order wrong. Somebody writes nigga on the receipt. Or they tell you, nigga, you can't stand in this store like they did them brothers in Philadelphia and call the police on you. The typical black or Negro mind thinks that Starbucks, that manager at that day, in that moment, disrespected me and was prejudiced against me and biased against me. And I will never go to that company that business or, 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 or get a cup of coffee when that manager is on duty. <laughs> That's our mentality. But it never crosses our mind. You know what? Why do I deal with white businesses at all? That doesn't cross our mind. That's a, that's a no, no. We don't go there, but you go to JJ's chicken shack. You order a two piece chicken 
three packs of hot sauce and Lord have mercy. Let them give you one pack of hot sauce. In your entire dominion, you will transform into a grand wizard of the KKK. This is why I don't deal with niggas. This, these niggas, these niggas, black on business. This is why I don't like black. Now, you done took a whole race of people, bunched them all up, and threw them clean under the bus over a pack of hot sauce. Where does that mentality come from? It's deeper than, than what we think. It's COINTELPRO. Stop the. You grew up all your life here, and niggas ain't shh. Black people in general and black men. So now, God, biblically, Quranically speaking, has to raise a messenger from amongst the people that he seeks to save. But the seed has already been planted in your mind that niggas ain't shh. So whether the brother really is a crook with a perm, whether he is a, 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 a brother standing in front of you with nursery rhymes, yes, yes, I can, or I am somebody, <laughs> Sam, I am, and all of that. Now you got to sit there and you wonder, because now it's connecting to everything you heard before. And then you even see the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. You see the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You see one of their ministers, one of their students. And you give them the jaundice eye. Not really based on actual facts. But just based on the fact that you have been brought up in a culture that is anti-black male. And we got to deal with that. That's why with a Al Sharpton, whenever I speak on him, just in conversation with other black folk or to anybody. First of all, if a white person come to me and say, what do you think about Al Sharpton? I say, that's my guy. All praises due to Allah for Al Sharpton and walk away. What you think about Jesse Jackson? That's my dude. What you think about Dr. Umar? That's my guy. That's my brother. Anything else, Brad? Anything else, Becky, that you would like to know? We got to get out of the habit. And that's why I'm not throwing these brothers on the bus on this public platform. We got to get, get out of that habit of throwing our people under the bus in front of our enemy. Because they are scientists. They, they are scientists. They make sure that when they enact a strategy, they want to see if it's working. When they tell us, this is the Negro that you should follow, this is the Negro you should hate, do we pay attention? When Black Panther came out, they sat back and watched to see if you would go to the movies in greater numbers to support a fictional black hero than you did when the Nat Turner movie came out to support a real black hero. They sat back and they measured that. And they kicked their feet up and they said, oh, we, we've done well. We're inciting more black pride out of them out of a, let me stop, I almost cursed, out of a damn cartoon written by a Jewish white man. than a real living black man who can empathize with our real sojourn. Some of you, oh man, I got to keep it all the way real. Some of you went and got your brand new dashiki made in China and went to go see Black Panther and cheered at the screen. And said, oh, we need a, we need a, we need a real Wakanda. Oh, I like that. We need a real Wakanda. Meanwhile, for the last 90 years, there's a real Wakanda under construction right before your eyes. Have you supported it? Do you support it? Are you a part of it? Or do you jump to deceptive and tell you, well, I heard, I heard Farrakhan, or I heard the nation, well, I don't agree with everything they do. Do you know what uh, Stan Lee, everything he believes in? Do you even know what his religious ideology is at all? Do you know how he really feels about black people? Well, he made a lot of black characters. Uh, okay. So did the person that wrote uh, Huckleberry Finn. Little nigga Jim. Hmm. 
See, they measure these kind of things. They watching. They watching to see how we react when somebody is raised amongst us that is actually beneficial to us. Shout out to everybody chiming in. Hit us up. Claudine. Thank you, Sister Antisha. Claudine. That was the movie. And that was a movie. Uh, James Earl Jones was on there. He was like her boyfriend or whatever. And they told him on the movie that if you live in the house, we can't give her nothing. And that was the beginning. That was the first Tyler Perry movie. <laughs> Let me stop. All praises due to a lot. Brother Jerome says we must pay attention to what and who we are listening to. Think about what we are thinking about. That's right. But I would I would say that we just got to be scientists, man. One thing I, I and our Western Regional Student Minister, Abdul Malik Saeed Muhammad, always touches on this. One thing I respect about the Caucasian, he's very nosy in the right way. He's the universal snooper, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. But if anybody's saying anything that makes any kind of sense, he pays attention. That don't mean you got to follow them and worship them. We, we got to understand there's a lot of space between zero and 100. Black folks got this, we got this, this, this habit of either I'm in love with somebody and I want to marry them and I want to build a statue with my bare hands of them or that nigga can kiss my, you know what? <laughs> you know, there's a whole lot of room in between those two extremes. Why don't you just come to the mosque and sit down and listen? Why don't you, if you walk past, you walking down the street and you pass some Hebrew Israelites, why don't you just listen for a minute before you even, without even trying to argue with them, just listen. You may get something out of that that makes some sense and then, then all the trash you hear or something you don't agree with, throw that away. But sleep on it. We have to be more scientific with what we listen to and, and who we so-called follow. Because you're a grown man and then they're not chaining you. There's no compulsion. You're not in a chain gang like you was in prison. We're going to touch on that in a minute. But that's what COINTELPRO is. And it goes back to COINTELPRO when it specifically touched on the Nation of Islam. They had an aspect of COINTELPRO where not only did they want to stop the rise of a black messiah, but they were very specific. When it comes to Master Fahd Muhammad in the Nation of Islam, they specifically wanted and attempted to disprove or to cast doubt on point number 12 of what the Muslims believe. Which deals with Master Fahd Muhammad that we believe that Allah God appeared in the person of Master W. Fahd Muhammad, July 1930, the long awaited Messiah of the Christians and the Mahdi of the Muslims. We believe further and lastly that Allah is God, and besides Him, there is no God, and He will bring in a universal government wherein we can all live in peace together. They wanted to challenge that by casting doubt on Master Fahd Muhammad being black and being God in person. It's actually public record. You can look it up right now. It's CG-25-3309-71. I've memorized the case number because you go into it and they're literally telling each other. They didn't know it was going to, they didn't know the Freedom of Information Act was going to be passed 40 years later, but they're telling each other through these memos that our main goal is to cast doubt amongst these Negroes on their leadership. That's why whenever you see your leaders do something stupid, compartmentalize it. You know, like you do when you get bad customer service at a white owned business. You don't think of it as this white owned business has done me wrong. You think McDonald's did me wrong on this particular day at this particular or that sister that's working behind the counter did me wrong. You're not mad at the entire white race because you're going to go somewhere else to another white company and spend your money with them. Compartmentalize it. Or you could be falling for a trap. Now, moving along, we're going to get up out of here in a minute. I got to deal with one aspect of uh, when it comes to black leadership that I hear so often. Y'all know how, how we do it on Nation Town TV. We got to bust up some of the BS that we are so uh, capable of doing. There's a quote that you hear, especially nowadays. And it relates back to what we was just talking about, the deeper tentacles of COINTELPRO stopping the rise of a black messiah. 
in the black household. <laughs> I don't follow no man. How many of you watching right now have heard that before? Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Not only is this one of the silliest things I've ever heard from us, but it's also the record reflects that this is a blatant lie. You a damn lie. You don't follow no man. In fact, if black people really didn't follow nobody, our communities would look completely different. Our households would look completely different. Daddy would still be in the household. Because it was, it was, you gotta understand, it was trash in daddy's mind that made him walk out of the household and be a deadbeat father. It was trash in mama's mind that made her say, well, nigga, get on. It was stuff that she was watching and that she was following. And it was things that he was watching and that he was following that caused that whole situation to happen. So our, our households and our communities would look totally different if that were true. But the lie detector test determined that was a lie. What's the lie detector test on? I don't follow no man. Let's 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 look into it. The new Jordans are coming out. Jordan is a man. Nike is a corporation owned by a man, founded by a man. Foot Locker Corporation owned by a man. All of them, Athletes Foot, all of them, East Bay, all of them, owned by a man. And we'll fight in front of the store. Stand in line, in a single file line, I mean. And we'll get mad at somebody trying to get in front of us when we trying to get them new infrareds. <laughs> they got some pink Jordans about to come out in a minute, and I'm telling you. It's going to be men fighting women over these, over these damn shoes. I follow no man, but when you go to any nightclub in America, in a black community, or that caters to black people, you will see black men and women dressed like whatever they saw on the last music video that they saw. We all got stuff to say now. The new Jerry Curl is skinny jeans. Remember how Jerry Curls, everybody was laughing at, at Jerry Curls in the early 90s? But then again, everybody had a Jerry Curl in the 80s. Right now, everybody is, is low-key laughing at Skinny jeans. I remember seeing Lil Wayne with skinny jeans the first time, and I said, oh, my God, what is wrong with this brother? But then I stopped myself, and I said a different kind of, oh, my God. I said, oh, Allah, everybody going to be dressed like that in a minute. And I was absolutely right. But you follow no man. Why do you wear the shoes you wear? Why do you wear your clothes like you wear them? Why is your hat tipped to the side quite like that? Why do you use the words that you use? Oh, you got to go get that bag. Where did you first hear that from? Facts. Who did you hear first hear facts? It's not because you know the definition of the word, because it's words we use and we don't even know the definition. Like I posted on Facebook the other day, people don't know what foreign means. They just hear rappers talking about foreign. They think foreign is anything that's expensive. No, foreign is anything that's not domestic. That's all foreign means. Hyundai is a foreign car. Toyota is a foreign car. Cadillac is not. A Dodge Charger is domestic. <laughs> anything that comes from a different place than where you are at that particular time is foreign. A foreign object is something that's thrown in, 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 in your circle that wasn't originally in your circle. You got beard gang. Everybody wearing beards. One of the first brothers I saw pushing this new trend of beards was Rick Ross. Who told you to, to wear a beard? Who, what, what? You was on Instagram. You saw a sister post on Instagram that, oh, she think beards are so sexy. So now you're doing everything in your power to grow a big old nappy beard, which is essentially, which is literally a magnet for bacteria in this COVID-19 era. But you you following a man. And then for all my I follow no man, Negroes, when you call yourself being independent, I don't even, I don't even work for the white man. I'm a hustler. And you get caught hustling something that was put in your hand by a man. 
Who do you think the plug is? He's a man. He's a man. And then when you get caught with that substance that the plug that man gave you, where do you end up? <laughs> Talk to me, Nation Town family. Where do you end up? And man, when you get here, I really want y'all to, I really want the brothers and the sisters to keep that same energy with your enemy when you get here. Because here, a man will tell you, take off your clothes, bend over. Now, I ain't talking about your cellmate. He might ask you to bend over too. But I'm talking about as soon as you check in. A man in a uniform. I want that to sink in. A man in a uniform will bend you over, will tell you to bend over, spread your buttocks. Spread your I don't follow no man buttocks and cough. And if you don't cough hard enough, he, he'll get closer to you and say, yeah, that, that, that ain't sufficient. And you ain't spread it wide enough. Mr. I don't follow no man. They even have prisons in Arizona where they got the prisoners wearing pink. I follow no man. It's like I mentioned last week. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad said, and our Savior has arrived, that there are two worlds. There are only two worlds. God and Satan. He used Christianity and Islam, and Christianity was cold for the white man's world, and Islam is cold for the black man. It's only two worlds. If you turn your back on one, then you are submitting to the other. And then the same brothers who will tell a brother like me in the nation of Islam when I invite them to the mosque or I invite them to accept their own and be themselves. Man, I'm cool with all that, but, you know, I like Farrakhan. I, I feel y'all what y'all doing, but, you know what I mean, I, 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 I got to eat pork and, and, you know what I mean, I, I got to get my weed. I got, and, man, y'all be dripping man, the way you, I mean, y'all look good, man, but I can't be, I ain't no shirt and tie kind of dude. I ain't, I, I gotta have my beard, cause I'm a, oh, this beard gang over here, uh, 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 but then you get arrested and you go to court. Soon as you go into, first of all, before you walk in the courtroom, this is how you dress. Like my brother here. I covered up his face, you know, out of respect. But look at him, he dressed like an FOI. I bet you an FOI couldn't get him to dress like that. Well, I'm sure one would if he would give that FOI the time of day. But he's about to go in front of this ham sandwich eating judge. And when this judge steps out of his chambers, you don't know this judge from a hole in the wall. But when this judge steps out of his chambers, what does the bailiff say? Come on, black people, we all registered uh <laughs> registered paralegals because we'd have been to court so many times and not for jury duty all rise and that brother stand right up i mean suited and booted white shirt tie suit ain't never put a suit on in his life went to his homeboy's funeral with with a ben davis suit on and some chucks but in front of this ham sandwich eating judge that's about to hit you right upside the head with the book, which is about to put a football jersey, a linebacker jersey on your back for the brothers that know what I'm talking about. When that bailiff says, all rise, you're going to shoot up out that seat. Because I follow no man. I just want you to keep that same energy in the courtroom. I'm not trying to start nothing. I don't want, listen, if you're facing charges, do what you got to do. But why now? Why are you following the man now? To our brothers that's in the street organizations, you following the man. You following somebody. Tookie, Larry Hoover, somebody. You following the man. You following your OG. He put you onto the set. You didn't have you didn't have to bang the set. I know how it is, man. I, I, I when I was before middle school, I used to fight every other week because I would bounce from one set to another to hang out with my friends. And since I didn't bang, it was like either we jump you in or you gotta fight us. <laughs> 
which is the dumbest ultimatum I ever heard in my life. Like, okay, either way, I'm going to get jumped. Okay, well, let me just get jumped for independence then. So I know it's a lot of pressure, but don't sit up here and look me in my eye and tell me you follow no man. The lie detector test determined that was a lie. And sisters, y'all, you know, y'all the same too. Come on now. You mean to tell me that everything from your hair did all the way to your toes, you just you just had an epiphany one day and said, you know what, I want my, te my, my toes to be done this way and I want to wear this kind of shoe because I just believe. And it used to be a time where sisters made their own clothes. Not even religious sisters. It's just you got old school mamas and grandmas who grew up making their own clothes. You don't make your clothes no more. You make clothes designed by other women. Sometimes other men. With their names on it. You follow no man. I'm sorry. And then I can't let my blue collar brothers. Ain't nothing wrong with having a job. Brother, get your money. Sister, get your bag. It's, it's all good. But does that I follow no man spirit follow you to work? When they tell you, hey, uh, Willie, uh, ah, we forgot to tell you, we're going to need you to pull a double shift tonight. Oh, I can't do it. Oh, well, uh, you know, we're making cuts. So you may be the first one we cut. You know, I hate to tell you that. No, it's nigga go grab them boxes. Nigga go put on this uniform. Nigga go drive that truck. Nigga go do this. Nigga don't eat this. Nigga don't smoke that. Nigga don't drink that. We we having weed tests next week. You better have clean piss. But if the nation tells you you need to put the blunt down, oh, I heard y'all kill Malcolm. <laughs> Why don't you hold... Facts over your boss's head. I heard y'all killed everybody. I ain't putting that uniform on. I ain't working that double shift. I'm not doing what you say do. Oh, I'm going to lose my job. Oh, okay. I understand. I completely understand. So can we do away with that? I don't follow no man. In fact, the American economy is almost built entirely on us on all consumers following men and women. That's why they put men and women on commercials. That's why men and women are models. They will even put clothes on a fake man. On They call it a mannequin. Because they know you follow men. They know you look at other people and you say, I like the way they're doing that. I'm going to do that too. Don't say you don't follow men. You just spent your last thousand dollars on PlayStation 5. Created by men, marketed by men, pushed down your throat by men. Don't tell me you don't follow men. And then to my sisters that were going so hard for Joe Biden and to my brothers who's advocating for Donald Trump, even though over 80% of black men actually voted for Joe Biden, that's a myth that black men are all of a sudden Republican. That's, that's a myth. But whoever you were pushing for, did you keep that energy then? I don't follow no man. You were standing out in the cold to vote for what? A man. Or a human. So we're not going to be on much longer. But one more thing I want to touch on. Again, going deeper into this psychology. Shout out to everybody uh, chiming in. Uh, <laughs> Brother Todd Hinton said the lie detector test is you follow that damn supermarket man and buy his GMO food. There it is. You letting a man feed you. Do you know that's the greatest level of trust you can give someone when you let them feed you? You let them put food in your mouth? Most restaurants don't even allow you to see the food being prepared. There's only a few places you can go to. A deli, a Benihana, and <laughs> like a Subway. Everywhere else... They, they take your order and then they disappear and then they come back with a hot plate of food and you can't wait to dig in. But you follow no man, but you letting strangers, you letting in anonymous people cook your food. You let anonymous people teach your children. When's the last time you've been to a PTA meeting? 
<laughs> All praises due to Allah. Brother Michael Neal said, yes, sir, boss. <laughs> they crossing the gun line, boss. Gun line. Gun line. Brother Jerome says, a lot of interracial commercials lately. Absolutely. Trying to frame our mind. Framing our mind. It's happening all through the media. In fact, most of the things we think are our opinions are being fed to us on a daily basis. Not by no church. Not by no mosque. You know, the, the enemy got a church, too. He got a mosque, too. And they having classes 24-7. They, 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 they got a mosque called Netflix. They got, a, or they got a church. They got a class called NFL, NBA. <laughs> Pay attention to the commercials that you watch when you're watching anything. The advertisements that pop up when you're watching something on Facebook. They're studying what they think you like or what they think you might fall for. So when you're watching something on TV and then a bunch of TD, uh, uh, T. Rowe Price uh, uh, and, and investment commercials pop up, that means they expect people who are rich or concerned with finances and wealth to watch that. If you're watching something daytime during the week and you see a bunch of trade school commercials, and, and, and stuff like that. That means they expecting single mothers who don't have that much education and, you know, didn't go to college. That, that, that tells you a lot about what you're watching. Pay attention. Pay attention. Let's, let's, let's wrap this up. Let me touch on this before we get up out of here. One big element of leadership that we got to be honest about is the idea of not just our self-esteem, because I touched on how some leaders just want to be seen. They just want attention. But that roots into our self-esteem. But the word I choose to use is slave esteem. We got a lot of slave esteem. Let's, let's, let's get into it. Because first of all, in slavery, one of the most prestigious things you could be was the Negro preacher. When they first started letting us uh, congregate for church, they didn't just let us. They would have a white man, any white man, sit in on the services and make sure that you wasn't teaching out of the book of Numbers or teaching the book of Exodus or teaching the Quran. <laughs> Making sure. In fact, I heard, I, I read somewhere that the origins of speaking in tongues was the fact that some of the slaves who were only one or two generations removed from slavery would speak their native Arabic, knowing that that slave master or that slave hand wouldn't understand it. But then the other slaves would mimic it, thinking it was just somehow just connected to God. And that's how it turned into this gibberish that we now know as speaking in tongues. But they were actually trying to pass on a message in the early days. But as you can see, you got the Negro preacher. The Negro preacher, that was paradise for a slave at that time because the Negro preacher not only had the approval of the slave master, but he was looked up to by the other slaves. There's another form of slave that had a slightly easier life than the rest of the slaves. And that was the entertainment slave. A lot of people don't talk about the entertainment slave, but there was always that slave that could play the banjo. It was always that slave that could sing. It was always that slave that could tap dance. Y'all remember Roots? What did they call him? Fiddler, because he could play the fiddle. Fiddler didn't have to work as hard as the other slaves. They put him in, in charge of the new slaves that would come. So fast forward to today, that epigenetics what are the two professions that so many of our people want? We want to be entertainers or we just want to be in front of people. I can honestly say never in my life did I intend to or request. Like I'm in the nation of Islam and, and all the believers in Mosque 27 can bear me witness. I never requested to be in, in, on the ministry staff. I never requested to help out with orientation class. I never requested to be a lieutenant in the FOI. I never requested any of those things. All I have, and I'm not, I don't even consider myself that intelligent. All I have is a deep 
sometimes inexplicable love for my people. <laughs> sometimes it's inexplicable. Sometimes I wish I didn't. I went in my early 20s. I tried to not give a damn about my people for a minute. I thought to myself, man, I'm not even tripping on my people. I, I'm just going to try to get this bag. I'm just going to try to get this money. And it was the most horrific four or five months of my life because I kept relapsing. I kept giving a damn. And it just led me to this life and it's led me to some of the things that I do. But that idea from slavery, that's why we love Christmas, because that was the day off that the slave got. See, epigenetics is real. So I'm not saying that everybody that raps or sings, they're doing it because it comes from slavery. I'm not telling you that every religious leader that it comes from slavery. But this is why our leaders and the people we follow, they seem to always have the same profile. Entertainers or so-called leaders that are approved by the enemy. Approved by the enemy. I call it slave esteem. Now, how do we how do we how do we prevent from falling for that trap of fake leaders? Let's get into that before we get out of here. Shout out to everybody chiming in. But we're going to wrap this up real quick. I went on a lot longer than I wanted to. But one thing you notice about going back to slavery. One thing I appreciate and I respect about some of the the uh, brothers and sisters who were slaves that are celebrated today in our community. They moved men. That's why I'm not big on that. I follow no man mentality, because really, that's the kind of Negro that will cause problems for Harriet Tubman. Come on, we got to go. We got to go to freedom. We got to get up out of here. Uh, why, why should I follow you? Who is you? I ain't going to let no nigga winch tell me to, to do this and do that. See, that's that. That's really what that mentality is. We try to undergird it with some kind of knowledge, some kind of wisdom. Oh, I'm not religious. I'm spiritual and all that foolishness. But that's what you really were. You were the kind of slave that gave Sister Harriet a problem. She's You the reason she carried a gun. Nat Turner. This is an artist's depiction of Nat Turner. See, one of them, look at this picture. One of them Negroes is saying, who this nigga think he is? I follow no man. It's a nigga that just got up and walked. It's a brother, excuse my English. It's a brother that just got up and walked off. I follow no man. But all of these brothers and sisters, they moved men. Toussaint L'Overture, he moved men to victory in Haiti. They moved men and they changed the course of history. So it ain't nothing wrong with following somebody. Just don't be a fool. And then last but not least, you can always tell who not to follow or who to follow by what your enemy thinks of them. Like I said, the Negro preacher was approved, was built by the enemy. The Negro preacher was approved and manufactured by the enemy. But when the enemy says things like, like this, this is the Israel Hayom petition to remove Nation of Islam leader from Twitter. They petition. When you saw the minister get pulled off of Twitter and Facebook, these weren't everyday American citizens petitioning from this. This was these were Jewish. Power brokers pushing for this. The minister banned from an entire nation. To this day, the minister cannot. If he flew to UK, to the UK, he could not make it out of the airport. They have a standing ban on him to this day. They won't even let them play a video of the minister in a public place in London to this day. The Guardian says the UK, they have the right to ban Farcon. When your enemy is telling you, don't listen to that man, that is a clear sign that you should listen to that man. <laughs> if, he, if they say, don't listen to this woman, that is a clear sign you should listen to that sister. Now, if they say you should listen, I'm not saying that you, sh that you shouldn't off top. 
But when they say don't listen to them, ooh, ooh, it's a movie I'm going to watch today called American Skin. Some of y'all may have already seen it. I wasn't that hyped up about seeing it until I read the reviews all over the internet and all the reviews were saying, oh my God, this is, this is not what America needs right now. This is divisive. This is, this is hate speech. This, oh, this is, it's so preachy. I was like, oh yeah, I got to see this movie. I got to see this. Got these white folks pissed off. Resolution 772 condemning Louis Farrakhan for promoting ideas that create animosity and anger toward Jewish Americans and the Jewish religion. See, this is how you know that the person that you're following. And, and, and if that does that word sting your ears a little bit, follow? If so, why? You follow people all the time, like I just pointed out. But why does that sting you, the idea of you following a black man? You got to come to terms with that. And last but not least, I want to talk about money. Because the sister pointed out earlier, if I could find the comment, and we're going to close out with this. She says they are paying Jesse Jackson and Sharpton. She said, this is Sister Rhea. She said, how many times have they thrown us under the bus and I heard you can buy them cheaply? And I agree with my sister on that. But here's the catch 22 on that. Here's the catch on that. He who pays the piper dictates the tune. He who pays the piper dictates the tune. It's said that we, 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 throw, we throw that word sellout out a lot, don't we? And in most cases, when we come together, that's one of the few times, that's the time where we almost stay 100% on code is when we dissing a black man, calling him a sellout or a coon. We, we, we come together on, on that kind of stuff quick. But why, is it, why does that fall off our tongue so easily? But do you know that because of the economic and the, and, the, and the capitalist society that we live under, everybody in a way, shape, or form is for sale. Our leaders are for sale. Our leaders need help. Not only is it difficult to lead black people, it's expensive. Every time something happens, people ask the question, where's Louis Farrakhan? Where's Black Lives Matter? Where's this? Where's that? Okay, if they're going to get there, they got to buy a ticket just like you. They got to get there. They got to physically get there. They got to have the resources to make a certain difference or a certain change. And I'm going to tell you what a lot of sellouts are. A lot of sellouts have been bought and paid for by the enemy because... We didn't buy and pay for them first. Now, this is the hard part of the program. And that's why I'm, I, I saved this for last. Because we have this very ignorant and really childish mentality. And I want you to just listen how crazy it sounds. If I play football or basketball, I should make millions. If I rap about shooting black people and disrespecting women and spending all my money with white folks, giving them all that money back through jewelry and clothes and cars, I should make millions. If I sell dope, I should make millions. If I work for some white man at a company somewhere, I should make thousands and millions and be successful. If I work for my people, doing what's right by my people and by God, I should be broke. When it says in the supreme wisdom that the 5% are the poor righteous teachers, it's not talking about financially poor. It means poor on two levels. One, it's talking about geographic location. America in the Western Hemisphere is the poor part of the planet Earth. Secondly, it means poor in terms of sympathy. You ever driven past the homeless person on the street eating out the trash can? 
And if you really felt that bad, you would hop out the car and do something for him. But you just drive right past and what do you think? Oh, that poor brother, that poor sister. Whenever you see somebody living a lifestyle that you know is difficult, that you know is inconvenient, you think to yourself, oh, that poor person out of sympathy. But not, be, not because of their bank account or their lack thereof. So in our lessons, when it talks about the poor righteous teachers, it's talking about our location and the nature of the job of trying to wake up the 17 million or more dead black people and deliver them to the Lamb of God. Man, oh, poor brother, poor sister. That's a hell of a job. Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad said it's the hardest job ever done since the creation of the sun, moon, and stars. That's what that means. But it does not mean, and if that's in your mind, you really have to, you can't be woke. Let me, let me end this right here with this. You can't be so-called woke, conscious, intelligent, knowledgeable, whatever you want to call it, and think that a leader of the people that you say you love a real leader, a real leader that gives people, that changes people's lives, that takes pimps, prostitutes, dope dealers, gang bangers, drug users, and turns them into Malcolm X's. That kind of leader, the kind of leader that'll put his life on the line and say to the government that no young black man should join the military. And that America owes us a check as black people. That's what Dr. King got murdered for. They blew his jaw off because of that. And I don't really believe in that. Oh, he didn't really die from the gunshot. They suffocated him. No, they blew the man's jaw off. I, unfortunately, I've seen the autopsy. The man, they, they, they reattached his jaw. They put some really good makeup on him in the casket. They blew that brother's jaw off. Because he told you not to go to war and he told you to boycott white businesses and he told you that you deserve the check from the government just like the white man got one. So they blew his jaw off. That kind of leadership should not want for anything. Do you want to lead? Do you really want a good leader waking up in the morning worrying about paying the rent or keeping the lights on over his head or her head? Do you really want that? You shouldn't even want that for your friend, much less somebody that's put their life on the line for you. So we got to we got to be smart. We know what leader means, but what are they leading us to? What is the evidence of that? And the best evidence of leadership is not a check. It ain't a handout. The greatest evidence of leadership is the improvement and the manufacturing of people. Who do you see changing people's lives and the direction and the trajectory of their lives? You see a brother or sister doing that, they deserve your support. If you no longer see them doing that, you deserve to withdraw that support. But don't throw us all in the same bucket like you would, like the like like a grand wizard of the KKK would. With that said, again, we're gonna try. We we want to leave you with the words of the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan. Shout out to everybody uh, chiming in. Brother Michael says, "He who pays the piper dictates the tune." Uh, Michael says, "The five percent of the poor righteous teachers. Why does the devil keep our people illiterate, so we can remain a tool and also a slave?" Uh, but all praises due to our live brother Tadeshi Tyrone. But we're going to close out with a message from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Please pay attention as he touches on the topic we were just dealing with as far as finances is concerned and about black leadership. I'm going to leave you as I greeted you in the words of peace. Assalamu alaikum. got blacks received over 300 billion dollars last year that's bank brother and sister you got money 
but you're so divided you can't pool your resources to do constructive things for yourself. That's our problem. We got plenty of money. That's why Nike can pay Michael Jordan millions and millions of dollars because you got money to buy Nike shoes. They wouldn't be giving him those kind of dollars to endorse their product if you didn't have any money. You're rich, but you're divided. What makes me free? I don't go to white folk for money. Isn't that wonderful? Now that's all right. I got a dead president in my pocket. This is Mr. Grant. And I ain't going looking for a grant from the people of Mr. Grant. But I go to you, because you got Grant in your pocket. Wait, 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 wait. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, my bank is the hearts of my people. And as long as the hearts of my people are with me, I shall never go to the bank with a check and have it marked insufficient funds. Now, why don't black leaders work for black people? Why don't black leaders work for the hearts of black people? Why are you out here? Because your hearts are touched by Farrakhan. So if I need help, who should I come to? God and you. And because you support me, I can talk 